relationship with. Um, and that has to be there too. Um, it's weird, because I'm trying to get you all to read this book and I'm saying all that, but <laughs> um, you know, people even ask Mary Carr herself, they're like, well, is Wallace canceled now? <laughs> And she said, no, you know, still read it. I don't know. Like, there are no writers who aren't troubled figures, and so if you like it, you got to read it. But, like, um, don't feel like if you don't like the personality that's producing this book as you read it, that means there's something wrong with you, because that is also not the case. The man was, was, was human. Um, so, is it worth it? Well, I mean, what, I can, what I'm trying to, I guess, suggest to you here is that what this is is... Uh, polymath genius um, who was um, a very gifted observer of human nature um, and a very in some ways empathetic soul um, exploding his troubled mind across 1200 pages um, and uh, it's in many ways worth trying to delve down into his personality and see what you find but you know it's also understandable that's not everybody's cup of tea okay literary context so two terms matter here, um, and I do apologize for the jargon. I will try to make sure these are the only two that I use, but they are doozies. One, the encyclopedic novel. Um, so what literary critics mean when they say this is that for several centuries, in moments of historical crisis or intense social change, authors will appear who try to write a novel that records all human knowledge about a subject. Um, some of the earliest examples that are cited of this are uh, Don Quixote um, and a medieval French novel uh, uh, called Gargantuan Pantagruel. Um, there, are, there are some other ones, but I don't need to go too, too alienating with the literary reference. Um, the second term is postmodernism, a hard to define artistic movement occurring from 1945 to maybe now or maybe a few years ago. Nobody's quite sure if we're still in it or not that unfortunately ties its definition to another hard to define term, which is modernism, right? So this is our problem in 20th century studies. Everybody's like, oh, modernism. And then people are like, what the heck is that? Like, nobody's quite sure. And there's this other thing that called itself postmodernism, which just means that which is after modernism. And we don't even know what modernism is. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> we'll start with the encyclopedic novel. Uh, some examples are that people probably heard of are Moby Dick, uh, right? Uh, so in this period in the late 19th century, the U.S. is moving from being an agrarian backwater to an international industrial powerhouse, and Melville wants to record all that he can about an industry um, that American imperialism was founded on, whaling. I take a picture of the book, right? And just to, to drop in here, Moby Dick was our novel last summer, so this, oh, this will... Oh, so everybody's read it. So, well, <laughs> okay. so this will resonate, I think, with many of our participants, which is excellent. I'm glad you didn't ask me to have to do the lecture on that one, because honestly, <laughs> I find it more difficult in some ways. I remember I read that in grad school, and I was like, I was like, this is a ripping good sea yarn for about 200 pages, and then I was like, man, this is a lot of stuff about whaling, and then it was just about 400 pages of whaling, 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 and then all of a sudden the ripping good sea yarn came back, but all of a sudden everybody was a symbol for Jesus. <laughs> and I was, I was a little confused as to what was going on. So um, I do the 20th century. <laughs> Another example that everybody probably knows is James Joyce's Ulysses. This is a particularly important one for independent Shasta and for David Foster Wallace. Um, as World War I is ending and the Irish nation is rebelling against England for its independence, James Joyce writes a novel that he claims will form, quote, he said this, he, <laughs> the man was not humble. A picture of Dublin so complete that if the city one day suddenly disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. Right? His idea was to take uh, the, the day that he, uh, many literary critics are euphemistic and they say that he was taking the day that uh, he met his wife, who would become his wife. It's not that he met who would become his wife, it's the day he consummated his relationship with the woman who would become his wife. But he, he took that day and he wanted to basically record every second of that day in the city of Dublin and have a novel that was Dublin on this day. Right? That's the encyclopedic impulse. Postmodernism. With apologies, I can't do this without talking about modernism for a second. <laughs> Uh, it defines itself against modernism, an artistic movement from about 1900 to 1945. People also argue about the numbers there. Um, modernism, uh, rapid industrialization and scientific advance 
reshaped the world at the end of the 19th century more rapidly than at ever any point in human history, and it's not even close. Uh, right? the, the world of 1850 and the world of 1900 were just fundamentally different places um, in any number of ways. So in the early 20th century, some artists look at mass media, expanding lifespans, global travel, massive cities that didn't exist before. I forgot to put urbanization on there, but that's one that's cited. Technological progress, and they have intense optimism. They think that you know, humanity's really going places. There you might think about the utopias of H.G. Wells, right? In more ugly senses, you might think about the political visions of either fascists or the USSR. So there, there's some dark sides that that sort of like faith and the human ability to control the world can, can take on. Um, other people look at the devastation of World War I um, and they see a sort of dark fatalism in human nature. They think that humanity is coming to know the entire world and to control it, but that that is a bad thing doomed to end in failure. And here you might think of T.S. Eliot, right? Uh, the, um, the Hollow Man, right? This is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. That sort of thing. Um, but regardless of what kind of modernist you are, uh, they basically all share a sense that humanity does have a nature that is knowable, whether it's good or bad, right? Um, and that the world is knowable and comprehensible and can be empirically understood and controlled. And uh, yeah, they have this sort of like faith in human reason and science. Postmodernism uh, comes after 1945. And the general reading of what happened here is that the world had seen its second world war in 30 years, right? After the war to end all wars, the one that was supposed to form an international order that was going to keep the world safe from now on. That war dwarfed the previous scale of human atrocity of World War I, which had already dwarfed any previous scale of human atrocity. Um, and it's not just the scale of death that happened in World War II, but it's horrors like the Holocaust, right? Things so hideously irrational uh, that they, they showed a, the deep capacity of human malice, cruelty, and insanity. All of which was ended by the good guys of the war unleashing a weapon on the world, which had now escalated to a Cold War situation where humanity lived under a constant threat of total self-annihilation because of perhaps a bureaucratic error. We can think of movies like Dr. Strangelove. Right? So to writers at this point, human reason seems tenuous, flawed, and weak. Um, but at the same time, that they have much less faith in the human capacity to sort of understand really anything, right? The world is still modernizing at an even faster pace than it did in the period of modernism. Uh, so the world has become hyper-connected. Has become hyper -connected. Air travel brings us all together. Uh, super states like NATO and the EU begin to form. Transnational capitalism becomes a thing where corporations are no longer really located within single countries, but they sort of span the world. You can go to a McDonald's in, in Moscow at the height of the Cold War, right? Um, transnational capitalism, Cold War, yeah. And then eventually the internet, which puts all of the information of the world at your fingertips. Um, and so we have the postmodern encyclopedic novel. <laughs> it's, right? Uh, this is actually a genre, I didn't make this up, but uh, one of the things that people notice about post-45 American literature is that there's this tendency over and over and over again for people to write and cite these giant encyclopedic novels. Um, and uh, Infinite Jest is only one of the most recent within this trend. And he's very self-aware of the fact that he's coming in this tradition. Um, so uh, in this new moment of crisis, several encyclopedic novels emerged that sort of satirized this modernist idea of total human knowledge. Um, which is to say that they stuff themselves full of information on a whole wide range of uh, discourses, uh, uh, discourses and, and fields of inquiry, high and low, scientific knowledge, but also comic books or show tunes, right? Um, but they also give you the sense that no matter how much knowledge you ever manage to amass, you're never really actually going to understand the world or your place in it, <laughs> right? They're deeply cynical about that concept. Um, so, according to English professors, the novel has always been about trying to replicate human experience, right? You read books to sort of like understand how people live in the world, right? That's what they're for. Um, the idea of this type of novel is to say that uh, the human condition 
in, in the modern America is information overload, paranoia, confusion, fear of apocalypse, shallow consumerism, and the constant worry that you're somehow the butt of history's joke on humanity. Okay? It's uh, cheery stuff. <laughs> Uh, and the two books that I'm thinking of here is, uh, there are dozens I could mention, but uh, the two major ones for Infinite Chess and for most people's literary uh, cosmo cosmology are a book called Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, um, a book about which I have written a great deal, uh, and Don DeLillo's novel Underworld, which actually comes out uh, shortly after Infinite Jest, but uh, Wallace had taken up a literary friendship with DeLillo and had been reading and commenting on drafts of the book. Uh, while he was working on Infinite Jest. Um, just circling back to the problem of literary celebrity, I would say a part of why Infinite Jest became the thing that it became is that um, the literary agents and publishing industry of the world found themselves in a bit of a pickle, and that the pantheon of post-45 American writers, you could probably say, I think most people would agree that the big four were Pynchon, DeLillo, uh, Tony Morrison and uh, Philip Roth, um, all of whom were born in the 1930s, um, all of whom by the 1990s are starting to get up there. Um, we still have we still have a little impingement with us. Pinchin, I think. I think I think we would know if he died. <laughs> He's very reclusive. Um, the um, we, we, sadly we don't have Roth or Morrison, but um, they were. People were starting to wonder, Pynchon especially had slowed down, but some of the other ones did. People didn't know how many more books we were gonna get from them. Is it interesting, it turns out, all four of them actually entered renewed periods of literary productivity in the 90s, which might have something to do with them wanting to guard their own sense of their legacy. Um, but the question, if you're a person who runs a, a, a publishing industry that is already beset by declining sales, is who are we going to sell as the next literary genius, right? And this 30-year-old wunderkind comes along Right, uh, with this book that very self-consciously tries to position itself as something that is these kinds of book, right? Um, and it's like catnip, they can't resist it. And that's where the hype machine kind of comes in. He came in at exactly the right moment uh, to sort of alleviate everybody's anxieties about who the next pension was gonna be, basically. Um, I probably won't get into it that much when we discuss this book, but it's worth noting too that not Underworld itself, because again, it wasn't out, but uh, DeLillo's fiction, Gravity's Rainbow, and Joyce's Ulysses are constantly referenced throughout Infinite Jest. In a lot of ways, they're both uh, explicit, um, uh, if you've read those books, um, and also uh, more subtle. Um, since I assume that many people will not have read those books, I don't want to get into that that much, but I do want us to understand that like, the reason I'm telling you all of this is that David Foster Wallace, an English professor, knows all of the history that I just gave you, and is very much thinking about trying to make himself out to be a person who exists in conversation with these authors. Um, okay, so all of these books have some key features, and really, this goes across like all postmodern encyclopedic novels, and hopefully we can see some ways that Infinite Jest is doing all of these things. Um, so, one of the features, they're massive, right? They're big doorstops of books, right? Um, Gravity's Rainbow is 760 pages, Underworld is 825, and Infinite Jest tips those Toledos at a whopping 1,079 pages. Although I guess you can say the 200 pages of it is footnotes, uh, but it still comes in at I think 980, um, even without that. They're also incredibly dense, right? Uh, they have a wide range of scientific and cultural knowledge. They expect you to be able to follow along to the discussions of calculus and trigonometry, uh, with pharmaceuticals, uh, with uh, Rocketry and Gravity's Rainbow, uh, with uh, organic chemistry and Gravity's Rainbow and Infinite Jest, um, with uh, tennis strategy as a big part of it uh, is David Foster Wallace. They bring in all of these really obscure fields of knowledge that they say everything they can say about. They have huge casts of characters, right? All of whom seem like they're not connected at all. And it's very difficult to follow why you're even looking at who all of these people are, except as you continue to read, there all starts to be all of these ways that you see that they all exist in some sort of like loose social network, right? So you know you have that thing, like especially in a city like St. Louis, right, where like you're talking to a person and they're like, 
oh, you know so-and-so, I know so-and-so, how did you know so-and-so? Oh, we were at this place. And you're like, oh my god, we must have walked by each other at that show, and we didn't even know we were there. Right? The, these books basically dramatize that. <laughs> Right? By having all these characters who don't have anything to do with each other, except they all kind of do in the sense that they all exist in this network. Um, all of these books will always have sinister international political conspiracies. Right? There's this sense that uh, in, the Cold War, in the Cold War and now since after, that there's some sort of sinister cabal of government agents and businesses that are probably controlling how things go in the world, and you can kind of see them, but not quite. Right? Um, and this is always dramatized through these books. This is a key thing. Every one of them has a MacGuffin. Do you know? Do you know? Kathy, do we know what a MacGuffin? Okay. I don't. I'm not familiar with the term. No. <laughs> the MacGuffin uh, is actually Alfred Hitchcock's term, and he was talking about film. Mm. Um, and what Hitchcock was talking about is films that have an object that is basically the narrative motivation of the film, but is actually irrelevant in itself. It's it's the thing that everybody wants but what it is doesn't really matter. Uh, so like his example would be the Maltese Falcon, mm. from the Maltese Falcon. But we, other examples we can think of, if anybody watches these Marvel movies, right, there's always this thing where there's these stones they have to get through mm -hmm. all those 18 movies, right? And in each new movie there's like a new stone and a bad guy's gonna get it, and if the bad guy's gonna get it, it's gonna do some vague thing, but it isn't totally clear what. And the point is like it doesn't matter what the stone is or what the stone's gonna do, the stone is just the thing that gives a reason for the good guys and the bad guys to punch each other. Right. Like the Ark of the Covenant. Like the like Ark of the Like Indiana Jones, yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, it, uh, maybe a more sort of like appropriate to Infinite Jest example is uh, Quentin Tarantino's film Pulp Fiction, which is very postmodern in the 90s and, and similar to what Infinite Jest is doing in some ways, where everybody's after this suitcase that they open up and like anybody opens it up and you always see it from behind, so you never see what's in the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But they open it up and then like their faces glow because whatever's in there glowing and people look at it and go, oh my god, is that what I think it is? And you never find out what it is. <laughs> uh, but like Tarantino's point is that, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Like, like it's, it's the MacGuffin. It's the thing that just moves the story around. Um, so um, they've, they've all got this. Uh, in Gravity's Rainbow, um, uh, all of these different international corporations are trying to find the first V2 rocket that was tested somewhere um, for different reasons. In the Willow's novel Underworld, um, there's this baseball from a consequential, um, uh, a famous baseball game in 1951 um, that uh, everybody's trying to, but it's famously been lost to history. <laughs> And it shows up in the novel, and somebody claims it's the ball, and so people are trying to trace its history back and figure out, you know, if it is the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in Infinite Jest, of course, the MacGuffin, some, David Foster Wallace would call it a MacGuffin sometimes in interviews, more than once. I found this in my research when I was going back through interviews. There is the film Infinite Jest, yeah. right? Uh, made by James Owen Candenza, the deceased father figure who sort of haunts the entire book, almost literally, you'll find when we get to the end. Um, who has made a film that is so entertaining that a person who watches it loses the will to do anything but watch the film over and over and over again until they die. Um, and everybody wants this film for different reasons, and it sort of moves the plot around. But again, remember, I cannot stress this enough, that's only incidental to whatever those, these stories are oftentimes doing. Okay? Um, mass media and pop culture. Uh, so as highbrow as these books can be with scientific and cultural knowledge, um, they're also very much into television and commercials and cartoons and comic books and show tunes and stuff like that, right? Um, this is pretty new. Um, Joyce maybe was unique among the modernists in that he tended to talk about the popular culture of his time, but, you know, most modernists were sort of famously or understood to be a little bit too snooty to want to deal with that kind of stuff. They want to talk about uh, the ancient Greeks and the Latins and sort of like obscure Provencal romantic poets. Right. Um, they don't want to talk about you know, newspaper clippings. That's actually not at all a fair thing to say about the modernists, but that's, <laughs> I think a lot of them are actually much more engaged with popular culture, people are realizing. But uh, in general, that is the way they've been understood for a very long time. Going along with this, uh, these novels, and you're definitely going to see this in Infinite Jest, are very, very coarse. Um, they're concerned with basically, if what they're trying to do is represent what it's like to be an everyday person in the world right now, and be unflinching and catalog everything that goes on, a lot of the banality and messiness of everyday life is going to include addiction, sexuality, bodily processes like eating and defecation, sort of desires and frustrations of that. Um, and this, I think, could actually be one of the hardest things about this book, other than its difficulty, 
is that a lot of the time when you're reading the character sketches, David Foster Wallace is dramatizing the struggles of hardcore drug addicts, uh, which are people that he knew and he talked to a lot, and these can be very disturbing and ugly lives. Um, but they're lives that he thinks are worth chronicling, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And so these books make a point of not pulling back from talking about that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, I have one more very critical term I forgot. <laughs> they're metafictional. Um, and what meta means, people say that now, right? That the kids say that. Oh, that's meta. <laughs> what metafictional means is that it's fiction that thinks about fiction, right? Um, so, like, any time that you see people, like, you know, watching a movie in a movie, mm -hmm. you know that probably when the way that people talk about the movie they're watching is supposed to be a commentary on the film itself, right? He does the same thing. Uh, they think about how fiction tries and fails to represent our lives. Um, and a few things that you probably want to think about, the, the two major sort of, like, metafictional devices in this book are, I would say, uh, tennis and film. So the film specifically of James Owen Condensa. So whenever he starts talking about like the theory of tennis, what you should probably try to keep in mind is that what he's actually talking about is what he, David Foster Wallace, is trying to do as a writer. <laughs> right? Um, so I already said a little bit of this before. When they're all obsessed about trying to get to the show, right, and then they worry about whether or not it'll ruin them to get to the show, right? Uh, that's David Foster Wallace thinking about himself as a writer and very celebrity. Um, when people start discussing the theory of James Ryan Condenza's films, they're oftentimes actually discussing the theory of how this book is put together. So in Condenza made films that are called anti-confluential, is a, a term that gets used in the book, by which they seem to mean um, things don't, there's no confluence, things kind of fall apart and they're ragged at the edges and all of the parts don't come together. Well, that's this book. This book is written the way that in Condenza's films are, right? Um, and uh, there's this, for my money, one of the most hilarious scenes in the book when they're watching this sort of like, what's supposed to be a parody of, of Grindhouse movies that Incandenza made, where there's a, uh, a former uh, heroin addicted woman gets saved by an order of warrior nuns who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who take up street addicts and get them clean and then uh, 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 train them to become warrior nuns. Um, and, and it goes into this whole sort of like satire of Grindhouse films where she has to, you know, fight all these biker gangs and stuff, and she's like hitting them with a sensor. And, um, and he starts talking about how Incandenza is uh, making this film because he wants to satirize pop culture, but that at the same time he's worried that maybe he loves pop culture too much and he's actually just making pop culture. That's David Foster Wallace. <laughs> telling you that he's trying to like uh, critique mass media at the same time that he kind of loves mass media. You know, he hates television, but he loves television. Much like he hates drugs, but he loves drugs, right? He views television as a drug. Um, and, and he worries that he might be uh, sort of like indulging himself in the things that he's trying to criticize. Um, and finally, uh, all of these books involve central characters uh, who lose identity over the course of the book. They kind of come on. Um, and in this book we can see that with Howlin' Candenza, and you actually get clued into that at the beginning where you find out that after most of the events of the story, uh, something has happened to him. What happened to him is something we can probably talk about after everybody's read further through, but it's highly debatable. But uh, that he's given him some kind of nervous breakdown so that he has literally lost the ability to be understood. He still thinks in these incredibly intelligent senses when he talks it just makes this ghastly sort of rictus and noise that terrifies everybody around him. And he's lost the ability to communicate with the world. Okay. In other words, I'm trying to like bring this back down and make this more <laughs> easy now at this point. Um, the paradox of the information age is the more that we know, the less anything seems to make sense. I don't have an audience to ask, but I, this, this is the moment I, I want participation. But you know that thing? I don't think that this is just a millennial thing. I think this happens to everybody. Like, you go on Wikipedia because you want to know one thing, mm -hmm. and then it mentions another thing, and it's got the link. You're a librarian. I know you do this, right? And you're like, oh, what's that? I want to know about that. And you click that thing, and then it tells you about this other thing. And you're like, huh. And you go, and you start tracing out, and you wind up, like, all of a sudden it's two hours later, and you've gone 15 links deep, mm -hmm. and you can't even remember what it was that you initially started, like, looking for. But now you, you understand that there's, like, 20 more things that you didn't know anything about that you feel like you need to understand to be a responsible person and you're mostly just sort of like confused and exhausted, right? Okay. Hopefully everybody knows that feeling. Hopefully you know that feeling. I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> this book is intending to traumatize that feeling. 
That's what I've been saying <laughs> through all of this, right? Um, David Foster Wallace knows that feeling, and the book is intended to sort of like mimic that structure in the way that it works. Um, uh, so yeah, oh, oh, I got here early. Infinite Jest, the metafictional devices are tennis and films. Uh, and so I want us to think about two quotes where uh, he tells you what he's trying to do with this book, and then we can get to the plot summary. One of them is on page 82. This is where he's talking about the theory of tennis. The locating beauty and art of match play is not a matter of reducing chaos to pattern. It was not a matter of reduction at all, but perversely, of expansion. Each well-shot ball admitting of n possible responses, two n possible responses to those responses, and on into this infinity of infinities of choice and execution. Which is to say, oddly, the more interconnected the world becomes, and the more information you have access to, the more you realize you don't understand what's going on. Every time you go to answer one question, you wind up with two more questions. And you go to answer those two questions, and you wind up with four questions. Right? And on and on and on and on and on and on, um, out into an infinity of confusion. Um, just because I'll forget if I try to ask at the end, yeah. that, that quote, and I have, I'm not very far in the book, makes me also think a lot about um, linguistic theory, which I'm sure Foster Wallace was well acquainted with, and even conversation and the infinitely generative nature of human language. You know, you, you lob a ball across at somebody and something unpredictable will come back. Yes, 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 exactly. That's, yeah, I guess the other thing I can think of in the, um, the way that you just described lobbing the ball and the way it can come back is that this is also, it's the, it's the mathematical theory about how there's, there's not an infinite number of chess games, I guess, but it's what somebody's calculated out. There's like more variations of any of a chess game than there are like particles in the universe or something like that, um, right? Because like one move has so many other moves that can respond and there's so many iterations of it. And like, that's what he's saying. Um, the more you study, the more empty it becomes. Yeah, conversation is the same way. I think that's a really smart point, Kathleen, because um, a lot of what's wrapped up with postmodern novels is something called postmodern theory that I'm doing my best not to talk about at all. <laughs> um, but um, is these, these largely French philosophers um, who are writing in the 1960s and the 1970s about um, all of the ways that uh, the sort of scientific positivisms of the early 20th century, these scientific beliefs that we could actually understand everything, right, always pull themselves apart, <laughs> right? And one of the ways that they see that is that they, they, they're really uh, obsessed with uh, language um, and how uh, basically thought without language is impossible, right? We're all constrained by our language, right? We can only think where our language allows us to think. Um, if that seems hard, you can think about, I think, George Orwell, right, where, uh, in 1984, the point is that the government wants to sort of reduce people's vocabularies because that, that reduces their ability to express their ideas. Um, and uh, the post-structuralists point out that, as you're saying, uh, when you say one thing and somebody has infinite ways or has any number of ways to respond, and then you have any number of responses to each of the responses, it does that same sort of fractalizing, and you can never know how a conversation is going to go. You become lost in language. Yes. Um, absolutely, and, and that's a fundamental part, and that's why when people criticize these books, do literary criticism on these books, they bring in those philosophers all the time, and they talk about that and how it's working. David Foster Wallace actually claimed that he was trying to get away from that sort of like tendency within literature. Personally, I feel that he did not get so far away from all of that as he, as he thought he did. Um, there's some critical controversy there. I think actually more people would want to say that he did, and, and less people would agree with me, but some people would agree with me. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and the other quote that I've got is uh, here, uh, where Hal is describing a nightmare, a recurring nightmare he has about a tennis match. Um, it's like a tennis match like Dante's Hell. Um, where there are thousands of courts that intersect each other in all of these different directions, and lines going in different places, and nets at different angles, and stadiums sort of like overhanging him in all sorts of crazy angles and directions with people sitting at them. Um, and there seem to be all kinds of rules that actually govern how all of this is supposed to work, but he doesn't know any of them. And he's standing there in his gear with his racket, right? So this is one of those, like, you know, show up to class naked anxiety dreams, right? But um, with, uh, with this sort of massive tennis game that he has to play against an invisible opponent. Um, and he ends uh, describing this dream to the person he's talking to by saying, the umpire whispers, please play. 
We sort of play. But it's all hypothetical somehow. Even the we is theory. I never quite get, quite get to see the distant opponent for all of the apparatus of the game. The deal with these, well, here I'm, I think I have a better way to explain this. Okay. The world according to Infinite Jest. We come into life in the middle of a game that preceded us. There seem to be rules to the game, but they're so impossibly complex that we can't understand the rules. We know we're supposed to be playing the game, but we don't know what the game is. People we care about are spectating and seem to expect us to do something, and so we flail about with no idea of what we're doing. Right. Um, that would be, I think, the, the postmodern take on, on human existence. Um, when you're trying to make meaning out of one of these books, uh, you can go deep, right? Like the sort of like Wikipedia vortex, right? And trying to understand them. And you should, to some extent, take it as far as you want to go, because a part of the fun of reading one of these books, I'm going to suggest, is the new things that you learn trying to understand them. I really, really, really want to caution you against the idea that there's some way that you are going to make all of the ends pull together and make this book make sense. And the reason for that is that this is a book where maybe the point, if it has a point, is that you can't do that. Right? With this book or with anything else. Right? Um, and so you can see people try to do this with all these kinds of books, certainly with Infinite Jazz. I think uh, one of the other librarians was just telling me they found a picture of the book where someone just did a read-through of the book where they found every single reference to color. Oh. And they put a post-it note of the color that was mentioned in the book to see if they could discover some pattern. Right? People get very much in this sort of like a beautiful mind or like conspiracy theorist oh. mode where you've got like the string and the pictures and everything to try and like find the structure. But like, I think I, I would really aggressively suggest, I, I, a lot of critics agree with me, some disagree with me, but like, the point here is that they want you to let go of that. You know, what they're saying about the world is that like, you want to, to sort of like, make it all make sense, right? Make all the ends of your life come together, but that's just not what's gonna happen. And if you go through your life that way, you'll drive yourself crazy. <laughs> Right? Um, and so they give you books where if you are going to manage to get through the book, you have to let go of those impulses and you have to learn to sort of like live with it in a different sort of way. Um, okay. Plot and structure. Um, I just got like four slides here where I'm just going to try and explain like what nominally is like going on in the book. <laughs> it's because that can actually be really hard to follow. Right. Um, so uh, I, just, I, I want us to be able to follow that. Um, so. I've got two slides about the world of Infinite Jest. Um, so this is like a sort of speculative uh, fiction. He's writing a quasi-science fiction book that's set in like a near future from when he's writing in the mid-90s. Um, so it's set in the not-too-distant future from 1996 when it's published. He starts writing in 90, but whatever, in that period. James Owen Candenza uh, has helped discover cold fusion that has solved the world's energy needs, but it also produces massive waste. Um, this is before he founds a tennis academy and then becomes a famous avant-garde filmmaker. <laughs> um, the U.S. president, uh, who's <laughs> a Vegas showman and popular media personality with no political experience what, 